We're good. Morning, everyone. Uh, we have one announcement on the agenda, which I think, oh, my Zoom just got weird. Okay, which Jason put in the chat. Um, our basic SQL for Koha users webinar that we had on Monday, which went very well. Uh, the recording's available now. There's a link in the agenda. Uh, we had at least 83 people in the Zoom room at one point, which was great. Um, and I heard from some people afterwards that they thought it was really helpful. Um, and not just people who like hadn't ever done SQL, but a lot of people showed up who have been working in SQL, but maybe weren't like very confident in it. And we had a lot of people who um, said that they learned a lot. So that was great. Thanks, Jason and Christopher Brannon. I guess Christopher's not here, but um, they did a great job presenting. So thank you. Any other announcements? Well, um, later on this week, if I can get my employer to sign off on it, there's going to be a new adventure of Fred and the Avenging Chicken. Cool. Cool. Okay. Next on the agenda is the annual conference. So uh, lots of things are getting canceled. At this point, we are planning on going forward with the conference. Um, we're going to make a final decision in July. Turn that off since I was doing that. Um, so for now, we're going to plan on our same timeline. We're going to ask for um, presentation proposals in May and try to build a rough schedule. Um, you know, things are changing a little less rapidly now than they were a few weeks ago, but things are still changing rapidly and we're keeping an eye on it. Um, and so for now, we're planning on going forward with the conference in McKinney in September, but um, we'll keep you all up to date if that changes. Next item on the agenda is Kohathon. So that's like two weeks from tomorrow is our online conference, Kohathon. We're trying something new here. It's going to go all day from 8 a.m. Eastern time to 8 p.m. Pacific time. We've got um, the website is linked in the agenda there, which has our schedule. So we've got lots of things going on. Because it's like across all the time zones, we didn't we don't have like a solid lunch. We have breaks. We have lots of breaks throughout the day to like switch presenters and things, but um, we didn't want to do three lunches and didn't think it was fair to do one lunch that was only good for a, a section of the country. And we got so many presenters that we filled up all that time. So we are going to be streaming that on our YouTube channel and we hope lots of people can come to it. And we also have our new merch site, which is up in the, well, our new merch added to our Threadless shop um, that's Kohathon 20 themed with our logo. And I'll just put that in the chat. Um, they shipped pretty fast. I, like I, I did ship in, or I did an order like a week ago and it's gonna be here today. Um, so they've been doing that pretty quickly. It's nice to see that they tightened up their shipping because last year, anything we had prepared for the conference in Colorado seemed to take at least twice as long as a week, if not even perhaps a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I guess everything's on sale right now. And we got an email this morning that um, I think it's on sale, but they're taking, like, they're also have changed it so that for a little while artists get more of the cut or the shop owners get more of the cut than Threadless does or than they usually do. Um, trying to help out um, people who are affected by COVID. So.
So that's our Kohathon. Any questions about Kohathon or the annual conference at this point? I suggest that everybody take uh, their lunch break when I'm speaking uh, from 11 to 11.55, because I have no idea what I'm going to be talking about. And then I was informed the other day that I'm actually, that's actually the spot for the keynote speaker. I just volunteered to fill in for somebody else that can't be there. And now I'm supposed to talk for an hour and I have no idea what I'm going to do. So there's your lunch break, man. Uh, you could do the present uh, the highlights of your presidential year. Yeah, that's like four minutes, Fred. And then, um, I don't know, do you know any magic tricks? I'll, I'll think of something. I'm, I'm, I'll talk to the conference committee about it at the, at the meeting here uh, after, the, after the show. If it makes you feel any better, I have a general idea of what I'm going to say about, um, what is it I'm talking about? Mark Edit, but not really. Okay. Next on the agenda is the reference guide. Introduction to Koha. Uh, Jason, did you want to talk about this one? Yeah, I can. So the Education Committee has been putting working on putting together uh, reference guides for a while, and I did finally get one up on the website, so I just wanted to share with everyone. Um, and I guess I can share my screen. Let's see if I get the right one. Okay, so here's our website um, on the Learn From page. I've been doing a little work. There's this kind of little hacky navigation menu here now that'll jump around the page. Uh, but at the very top, we've got uh, quick reference guides and the introduction to Koha guide is there. Um, and I've got it in PDF form, uh, Microsoft Publisher, and then ODG, which can be opened with uh, LibreOffice and edited. So um, just pop it open. And it's it's meant to be like a bifold or a fold in half type thing, several pages. And um, it's just, this one's just an intro to Koha. It's got some basic information at the, at the front about Koha, about the community, lots of different links, um, a breakdown of the modules. Uh, there's some history about Koha down here. So if you're new to Koha or you have some gaps in your knowledge you'd like to fill in, you can check this one out. Um, and it's available. Thank you, Jason. Yeah, and that looks great. Uh, Jason made the template that the rest of the education committee is using to put together our reference sheets. Um, I should have, I'm putting together one on Koha DevBox to go along with my Koha DevBox live install I'm doing for Kohathon, which I do plan to have up before Kohathon. Um, so we've got some other ones in the work as in the works as well. Okay. ALA table update. John, do you want to talk about this? Sure. As is known to just about everybody now, about a week ago, maybe a week and a half, ALA made the decision to cancel its 25,000 plus person event to be held in Chicago in late June. We had already signed up and paid for exhibitor space in what is called a small press table. And as a registered exhibitor, we were given a number of different options. The board has elected to forward our payment for the table to next year's conference, which is also held in Chicago, as coincidence would have it. And it is actually coincidence because for those who don't know, ALA sites are actually chosen several years in advance. And it's very unusual for ALA to be held in the same city in two consecutive years. But it is, and so we've forwarded our payment for that table along with our request for a similar, if not identical space in the 2021 exhibition hall. So that's all been taken care of. So come about, oh, February or March, a year from now, we'll actively be soliciting for volunteers to staff the table at ALA 2021, also at McCormick Place in Chicago.
Thanks, John. Any questions about ALA table update? Okay. Um, committee reports, conferences first. Uh, we already talked about kind of all our big things coming up, our annual conference plan to be in McKinney in September. We'll keep you updated on that and we'll be asking for um, presentation proposals starting next month. Kohathon is later this month. We hope people can make it. Um, and ALA tables. Development committee, Rhonda. Committee met and we have three different proposals. Um, we're still gathering some information on a couple of them and then we'll send out the information to um, vote on which one the community wants. Um, and we'll, as soon as we get the last little bit of information, we'll, um, we'll get that out to everybody. So that's pretty much it. Okay, thank you, Rhonda. Any questions for the development committee? Rhonda, do you know off the top of your head what those developments are that we're looking at, the three? Well, that can help me with, it's the... Um, but customizing account line descriptions. Yes. Is one of them. Um, the second one is something that we talked about in the acquisitions group of being able to track uh, adjustments to budgets throughout the year. And yeah, yeah, and we got the, we got the numbers back from Bywater as far as what that will cost, ouch. So um, we'll see how that all goes. And um, I think it was just the two, I think there was some confusion of, I think those are the two main ones um, that we're, we're looking at. So the one uh, was $5,000, the one Lizette had, but then um, I know for sure we've got a thousand, another library joining with, with support on that one at $1,000. So, um, you know, the one that we're the acquisitions group is looking at is basically uh, Bywater divided up into three stages. So the first stage is uh, $1,750. Um, so that would be one that we could maybe get stage one going on um, for that. So that's what I know off the top of my head. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Rhonda. Okay. Education Committee, Jesse. Yeah, um, we did not have our March 18th meeting. It was canceled due to that's when kind of the pandemic was breaking out and lots of libraries were closing at the time. Um, so our next meeting will be Wednesday, April 15th next week at 11.30 a.m. Eastern time. Um, we kind of talked about a bunch of the things so far. Super successful webinar on um, Monday. I was not able to attend, but um, several of the Bywater people did and said it was awesome. So another shout out to um, Jason and, and Christopher. And um, we have a couple other ones that we're gonna discuss next week um, that we're gonna schedule. We talked about doing one for jQuery hacks, um, another sandbox session, um, and Koha documentation. Um, during the uh, virtual hack fest uh, last week. Lizette came to the um, Koha documentation as part of um, Koha US as president and um, discussed a little bit about documentation for Koha. So that was really nice. Um, if you missed it, there is the recording up on the Bywater Solutions YouTube channel. You can go back and watch that. Um, uh, we are meeting, I think, tomorrow or Thursday to. Um, test for Coathon, so we're going to um, practice doing a live stream just to see how things work. So um, we'll be doing that just to make sure everything works well. And I think that's it. So if anyone wants to join us next Wednesday, April 15th, 1130 a.m. Eastern Time is our next education meeting. 
Thank you, Jesse. Any questions for the Education Committee? Okay, uh, fundraising, that's Todd. I just got a message that he's sick today. Um, Jason, John, did we? Um, I don't think that the fundraising committee has met, as far as I know. The, the main thing was the getting the merchandise up on the web, on Threadless. Um, that's part of the fundraising committee. So we, we did make some progress there. Okay. And in support of fundraising, we now have a membership to philanthropy.org. We purchased the two-year membership for that. And it includes grant station access, which is something that Todd has graciously donated to the organization uh, in the past. So he has received, actually all of the fundraising committee received information on how to access that and utilize it. Okay. Next up is the finance committee. Jason very graciously put in a finance committee link report. We're doing very well. Uh, we've seen a few more members join. Our official membership count uh, as of the end of March is 77. And perhaps more importantly, uh, all of the outstanding memberships uh, that I expected to be filled have actually been processed. So it's not like there's any in a state of flux, if you will, where I was waiting for a check or payment or anything like that. So the 77 members listed in the report are actually all fully processed and full members of the organization. Financially, we're doing pretty well. Uh, if you take a look at the March numbers, the March numbers reflect the payment we made to ALA for the table this year. So the about $9,100 uh, is accurate of all expenses paid to date for what is now ALA 2021. And we're still doing pretty well because we haven't expended any money yet towards any uh, development. And of course, all of that money is still currently sitting uh, within the organization's checking account, even though it's been specifically earmarked for development purposes. A few other things, it is filing time, not just for those of us here in the States for individual taxes, but we as an organization have to file a document with the federal government as well as with the state of Kansas, which is our state of incorporation. I need to revise my documents slightly with the introduction of the membership year concept. The numbers we report as necessary to the federal government as well as the state of Kansas need to be calendar year. And we do keep track of both, but I need to make sure that I update my documentation since this is my last year as treasurer to ensure that the distinction is clear as to what needs to be referenced and uh, as needed included within either of those federal or state filings. The federal filing is due May 15th. That has not been extended surprisingly. We've received no notification as an organization that unlike personal income taxes, which have now been extended, I think it's to July 15th, apparently nonprofit and corporations have not received the same such benefit and still have to file their report in the same time manner as required before. Uh, May 15th for federal, June 15th for the state of Kansas will easily meet both of those because the, the changes that I need to make to the documentation are really all not, all not that significant. Still looking for anybody interested in either joining the finance committee or somebody that is not on the finance committee or on the board uh, interested in reviewing the organization's finances for 2019. If you're interested in either of those, please feel free to contact me at treasurer at cohan-us.org. That's it for the Finance Committee report. Thanks, John. Any questions for the Finance Committee? Okay. Um, Jesse put a link to the Koha Virtual Hack Fest for documentation recording in the chat in case anyone wants to uh, check that out. And now we're to open discussion, bugs, issues, etc. Anyone have anything they'd like to bring up? One of the things that uh, we talked about last month was a bug that is in the, uh, the advanced cataloging editor. And Heather and I both looked at that, and it looks like it's been fixed. Testing that both Heather and I did 
uh, seems to indicate that it was fixed, even though there was nothing specifically attached to the bug that indicated a fix had been made. So both Heather and I commented on that, and uh, hopefully somebody uh, on a on one of the boards will see the fact that the bug has been amended with two comments, and maybe somebody else will comment and comment on it as well uh, to finally close that off. Since it seemed like even though there was nothing specific mentioned. Uh, something changed somewhere that fixed the problem. Do you know the bug number, John? Um, off the top of my head, no. Heather, do you remember by chance? I don't remember off the top of my head, but I think I can find it pretty quickly. I'll take a look. Is that... One nine four one nine. That could be. Let me put a new tab up here. That looks like it's got a comment from you and a comment from Heather that it looks like it's working properly at this point. One nine four one nine. Is that what? Is that what it was? Yeah, one nine four one nine. Yeah, that looks like it. That's it. Yep. Interesting. Cool. It's always nice when uh, <laughs> bugs just get fixed. Yes. <laughs> because something else also was touching it, or because something else was actually what was causing the problem. You know. And when they fix that, it fixed this too. Happens sometime, and that's nice. One of the things I'm hoping, since, you know, I'm just like most of us, I'm here 40 hours a week. Well, one of the reasons I've never really looked at bugs is because at work I always get interrupted, and, and bug squashing is not really an interruptible activity. So I'm hoping to be able to actually start to, to look at a few more things and, and test them uh, when I have a little bit more downtime. Things, things haven't stopped. We're still going through you know, the end of the fiscal year and all of that, but it looks like if I can piece together more than just one or two hours of, oh yeah, I can take a little breather now uh, to be able to do more bug testing, especially in acquisitions, which seems to be an area where not a lot of that really seems take place, uh, I'm really looking forward to doing. Well, and I know one of the acquisitions bugs I looked at had like, there were a bunch of bugs that all depended on, you know, like a line of bugs that all depended on each other, mm. that there were enough that I didn't know what was going on in there. And acquisitions is weird because the, the sandboxes have a lot of patron data, they have a lot of good bibliographic data there's no acquisitions data. So you literally have to create a budget. You have to create this. You have to create like six different things before you can even begin to get to the process of starting to test. And even when you've got those six or seven things set up, then you have to create more things in order to be able to replicate the problem environment to start with. And that, that's one of the reasons why acquisitions bugs take such an incredibly long time to, to wrangle. That makes sense. I know we're, uh, the Valnet Systems Committee is starting to look at the 1911 upgrade notes because we have time to go look through and read them right now. Um, and there's a couple exciting things. The biggest thing that we're excited about is the claims return feature in 1911. Um, it is awesome. <laughs> and it's up on, you know, It'll be in 1911 and it's just a really nice feature because like now you'll be able to run reports on claims return stuff and see it from the patron screen and um, all sorts of stuff. And I'm really excited too because I, I signed off on it in Pueblo when we were there during, hack, during the like um, workshop days and then it got pushed. And so that was extra exciting for me. 
Um, in the chat, it looks like Heather's reviewing the Bywater Sandbox recording to learn more about testing. Yeah, there's, we did that, uh, they did that Sandbox recording in Feb, January? Um, yeah, during the first, well, during one of the virtual, bug squashing day, February yeah. 14th, I think it was, Valentine's Day. Yeah, and um, that's a really good resource, you know, because they just go in and do a couple bugs in the sandbox um, and show you like all the steps that you need to do both at like when you're setting up the sandbox and when you're applying patches and also like how to sign off on bugs in the sandboxes. So that's a great resource um, and very up to date because it's only a couple months ago. I'm also hoping to do more testing once I get my uh, dev box up and running on my home PC <laughs> since I'm not at work. Um, anyone else have any? Um, one thing that we haven't touched on today is our special interest groups. Um, I wanted to let everybody know that there's a new one coming up tomorrow for web development. Um, that's at 10 a.m. Central Time. It's on our calendar if you guys want to join that. We're we'll looking at, um, I think, Galadriel and customizations, that, that kind of stuff. UI stuff um, should be interesting. And then next week, we've got system administration on Tuesday. And the week after that, consortia on the 20th acquisitions on the 21st. I think that's it. But you can check out our calendar to see everything that's going on. Those of you that have expressed an interest in joining the development instance, or the, uh, dem not de development, I'm sorry, demonstration instance, special interest group, which uh, has a goal of getting a, a nice, pretty version of the system running for public display um, look for a message about that soon. Some of you have already joined the special interest group. If you haven't joined yet, but would like to feel free to just send me a message and I'll be sure to add you to the group because we'll be scheduling something shortly to talk about how we want to get that started. I am curious about um, what people are doing during this time with online registration. I've already asked Barbara lots of questions about this. Um, our library hasn't done online registration in the past, and I'm just curious what kinds of things people are doing um, to get patron, uh, people access to their electronic resources that didn't have a card before the pandemic. So we turned on, we already had self-registration turned on, but it wasn't assigning a card number. Basically they would turn it, we had it turned on. They could um, place a couple of holds and then they could come into the library and pick up, get a card and verify their address when they picked up their holds or when they came in. That was how we were doing it before. When we closed, we decided to turn on the auto. Uh, member num. Yeah, auto member num. Yeah. Um, then the problem that we discovered was that like we had some, well, we had a couple problems where the barcode numbers were too high. And so it was giving people like ones that were too long so they couldn't log into resources or ones that didn't have our prefix because like there was a, a like self check the self-check patron had been set up with a barcode that was just like 14 digits long in all nines. Mm. So um, we had to fix that. And Lucas at Bywater, I think it was Lucas, gave me a report um, that, or Andrew, that was um, a, it was like, it would give you like the most, re the highest numbers. So you could go through and fix any of those accounts. Um, that's, I, I put that in the Bywaters chat. I can also share it. 
it wasn't, it didn't end up being a very long report. Um, so I could even put it here and we just limited it to like 20 at a time. Um, and it does a link straight to the step where you edit the borrower number. So if you're going in and editing, it was mostly system accounts. Um, and then the other thing is that if you put, uh, let if there's letters or non-number characters in a barcode, then it doesn't auto mem number doesn't count those. It just skips over them. So like there were some that were expired patrons that just hadn't been deleted that were too long, and I just put like a a at the end and a note on the account. And so then like if someone called, then they could know why and fix it for the patron. Um, and then we haven't had any more trouble with that except we had to add uh, a note at the top using jQuery, the top of the screen that said like, please note your barcode number on the next screen because mm -hmm. you can't go back and get it. So we were getting a bunch of calls where people were like, I registered, but I didn't look at my barcode number. Help please. So um, we made that change and stopped getting those phone calls or got a lot less of them at least. Rhonda, here's what we're doing in McKinney. Okay. Um, we're doing it a little differently than that. Um, instead of turning on the auto number, we're so, so far we've added about 300 users. Wow. And we just have a few of us that we have two reports that we run. One that grabs every, we created a special patron category okay. for digital only so that we can track just these users. And it just gives us a report of all of those new, you know, register anybody that has that patron category. And we have another report that we run that only looks at the ones that have been created within the last hour. So we have a rotating schedule of a number of staff members that go through, check this report. Then we had these really old cards that were from years ago that were never used. And so what we're doing is uh, those of us that are managing this have a bunch of these old cards with us. We just quickly add that card number to the patron record so that it can log in because you know with some of the text share stuff you know there are not necessarily text share but there's some some oddities that we had to have we had some that look for the you know the prefix, um, or prefix or and and all sorts of different things yeah. and and mm -hmm. then we have a template email that we just put their card number in and we define their pin number at that point and we send it to them in an email and with links to the different resources they have access to. So okay. it becomes a nice marketing email rather than a, a thing. Downside is it takes staff time. Mm -hmm. yeah. But we've only had 300 so far, which is not bad. When you mm -hmm. and so that's what, three weeks or something like that? Yeah. That you've been, okay. Yeah. And yeah, for us, I'm, I'm literally in the library right now, um, and we've got a bunch of staff here, so we're all avoiding each other, and um, just trying to figure out how to get access to people, and that would, that would be an activity that we have staff to do, so that would, that would work. Yeah, and the reason we chose to use the old cards is we could just throw them out and we right. gave a short expiration date, and in the email it says, once we're back open, come on in, get your real card. <laughs> yeah. And then we'll issue them, and, and we can pull it up based on that patron category. Yeah, because that's the, the one question that we were kind of wrestling with, is how, you know, do, do we verify them first, and then give, assign the card number, or you're, you're assigning the card number and then verifying them later on? Um, yeah, and, and technically basically. that's a bit of a problem, but at this point in time, it's not that big of a problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm not too worried about it. Um, that that sounds similar to what Bedford is doing, is that right, um, Barbara? Yeah, okay. Um, okay, that helps. Um, and I see that, who is it, um, Jeannie? Also, it sounded like what they were doing, she said in the chat that they were doing something um, kind of similar. And with, Jesse put a blog post in the chat that describes how I have it set up, because I guess Donna, Donna wrote a blog post that's similar. Yeah, I watched that and, and so we're, 
trying to figure out how we want to do it during this time and hopefully that will extend into the future. So we've got lots of um, teachers contacting us asking if there's a way their kids can get access because we've got brain fuse um, and they would like to get their kids access to brain fuse as well as you know our overdrive and all that kind of stuff so thanks yeah heather pointed out they've been getting lots of duplicate patron records people who forget they have a card and register for a new mm -hmm. one um, so she's been searching the patrons to identify duplicates and handle them um, we're planning on doing that uh, there's only like five people working from home right now and everyone else is just like all our CERC staff are doing like some webinars and stuff, but no projects at this point, though they've been compiling a list and this is on there if they start having, if, if they run low on webinars and want to have people start working on projects to um, clean up the self-registered cards, like, because we already have a couple where like someone registered twice because she forgot to write down her card number the first time. So then she registered again so she could write it down. Um, and like we fixed that one because she called and told us about it. But um, we also, we've only had 75 people register okay. since this started. So um, we're not dealing with like a huge number of patrons here. And we have so, a much more informal system uh, to put out uh, some uh, paper, you just write down the barcode and your name and employee ID number, which is what we use for uh, uh, barcode number. I put out some of our more popular reserve books, hoping that they'll come back. But if they don't, well, then they don't come back because none of us are working there every day. I'm going in a couple times a week. Uh, this only works for a very small library, though. So the situation I immediately encountered, um, I set up a the patron self-registration, and they did a demo for some of our member libraries because we have 51 libraries. And the situation I immediately encountered was one director who said, you know, the self-registration completely violates all of our written policies by our board. And um, so I started working on a way to um, opt them out of patron self-registration, which is not terribly hard to do, but then he, uh, this one particular director, started drumming up anti-self-registration support among about 10 of the other directors. And so the solution I took, um, I talked to my boss and, and our other, the rest of the people on our team at the Neckles office. And we are turning on self, patron self-registration today, but anybody that self-registers will just be self-registered at our main office library. Um, and so we will be the ones getting the bill from Hoopla, um, which is our main electronic resource. Um, and so all of the new patrons will be self-registered here at the Neckles office. And I did exactly what Ed described. I created a new category called just self-registration. And we're going to have it all set up so that the patrons are immediately self-registered. They immediately get a card. They do have to, I turned on the email verification, so they will get an email that they will have to click on and um, follow that next step to verify that their, uh, that their email is at least accurate. Um, and then they'll be registered through our library and all of those self-registered cards will expire um, on July 31st. Um, so that's the way we're dealing with it here. Um, we're also, I'm setting up a web, we have uh, another situation here where patrons can normally go to our member libraries and um, get a Kansas State Library card. And so I've created a form that will be in the email patrons kit that says, you know, you can also go to this place and sign up for the State Library card online, which is a, a more involved manual process. But that was the immediate problem I had, though was library directors, which some of you don't have to deal with, but I know some of you do. That's I similar think. to what we did at CKLS as well. We have them automatically set up as a self-registered patron and they automatically come up as a CKLS patron. And that way we don't have to worry about our member libraries having more hoopla usage or, um, and we can easily keep track of the, the self-registered patrons. So it's, it's definitely the way to go if you have a consortium, I think. Yeah, exactly. Okay. 
do you have trouble with um, people lying about their address, you know, and, and uh, you know, or do you care in this time? Um, we decided we didn't care. Okay. Um, Here too. Th there was some discussion about that. We had a couple of staff members that did care, um, but they got outvoted. Okay. Yeah. I think that's kind of where we're, we're settling to in this, you know, in this time, we're just going to say whatever, roll with it. Yeah, that's what we decided here was like, for now, we'd just rather patrons can get access without having to, you know, we don't have anybody working in the building. Uh, so it, people can like call and leave a voicemail that gets emailed to some of the people who are working from home. Um, and then we call them back when we get to it, but like no one's working, none of the people who are answering the phone are working like 40 hours a week right now, because one of them is sick and I don't work 40 hours a week. And the other person who's answering the phones doesn't work 40 hours a week. So it's just like the three of us and no one's full time. So there's sometimes some delay. Like if someone calls, I work in the mornings, and if someone calls after I'm done and nobody else is working that day, it's going to be at least the next day before someone gets back to them. And so instead of having people like call to get a card or email someone to get a card, um, we figured if we have some people who already have like lost items on their account and they're getting access to the digital resources or they're getting, you know, they already have a card, but they want more canopy plays that we think for the most part, they're probably, you know, during this time, we'll just let that happen. And yeah, we also have them set to expire. Um, we set 60 days, but if we end up having to be closed longer, um, then we set, set it to 60 days like in March. So if we end up having to be closed longer than that, we're just extending our patrons who have expired who are expiring during that time anyway, um, to not expire till afterwards. So we just push them forward with anyone else who is expiring. So that's, that, that's another question then. How are people dealing with patron accounts that expire during this time? I'll tell you what I did is I just went in and updated everybody with the 2020 expiration date to a 2021 expiration date. Same date, just I, added a year to everybody's expiration dates. So I'm wondering what anybody, what any other libraries are doing, so. We did. Yeah, sorry. Um, we, we pushed ours out. Um, I can't remember if it was two months or three months, you know, just added three months. We had Bywater update it for us and just pushed them out three months or something like that. We did, um, anyone who's expiring from or had expired in tw from the start of 2020 until the end of June, we pushed them, or till the end of May, we pushed them back till like mid, end of Jul June or beginning of July. Um, and then we'll do it again if we need to. Uh, it looks like Michael said we had Bywater Mass change our expiration dates for three months. Same here. I just did a year because it was easy and and uh, that way we don't end up with a situation where, you know, 50% of the patrons are all expiring in the same month. That was one of my fears is if we, if we push everybody from January through June, six months out, then we're going to have everybody expires in the second half of the year. So. That is one of the things I like about the new um, uh, tool for changing due dates is you can just add days on instead of saying pushing everything to the same date. That I think was a good choice in, in the work that was done on that tool at the Hackfest. Have you used that, George? Yeah, Have I did use, use it, it. Um, in like a large batch because I had issues with the timing out. <laughs> Uh, I didn't have any issues uh, before the first time I used it. I had had Bywater push everything 
to a specific date. And so I was just going back and looking at things between two specified dates. I think I was doing everything from, I think I was doing all the things that had due dates between February 1st and May 3rd. I had them push them to, mm -hmm. to one date. And then um, that was when we still had some libraries open and some libraries not open. So then when the governor ordered everything closed, um, that was by then the new tool was added and I just pushed out everything by eight weeks um, mm -hmm. for that same time frame. And so there were only about four or 5,000 items that I changed on that, that batch with the, uh, using the new tool. Um, that'll all change once, you know, if this order gets extended, if libraries aren't reopening by May 18th, that I'll have to do it again and we'll see what happens then because it's going to be a lot more items. So if it, if it does start having problems, I might have to do it at a library, by, like just do chunks of libraries, like do all the little libraries in one batch and do all the bigger libraries singly. Yeah, we, we had ours set to the 15th and tried to push them to the 30th on Monday and there's just too many checkouts. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't go. So I had to have Bywater do it for me. That, that was what I was going to ask. When I tried to do it, I couldn't get it to work for anything other than tiny little amounts. And so I just had them do it. I well, then I, I, I might end up asking by what to do then too. Although if I can, if I can figure out how to break this new tool, I'd love that. I love breaking <laughs> shit. Well, all you got to do is ask it to do more than it can handle, <laughs> which is easy to do. I can Absolutely. totally do that. <laughs> Bob said he had a gateway error on one batch, but it did update the due dates. Well, I don't know how it updated. I mean, with mine, it wouldn't even give me the list of the, of the. Yeah, oh, okay. that's what I had too. The patrons dubbed. And, and I was only looking at a week's worth of patrons in one patron category. And if, if I can't do that, it's useless to me. <laughs> Um, I was able to do a few hundred. We had originally had Bywater do from like the day that libraries started closing. Ever, just extend everything for all the branches. The director said it's easier if we just have it all be the same day. Um, do it for everyone at once. But then they later decided to go back and do like the first two weeks of March before libraries started closing. Um, since people were already starting not to go out as much and that like, oh, maybe someone really couldn't get in. And so um, I was able to extend those fine, but I did um, um, one branch at a time. Well, one, one like group at a time, but um, none of the lists were too huge when I split it up that way, but I had some trouble when I tried doing everything. Um, it might've loaded eventually, but um, I ended up having to leave. And so then I did it the next day and just did it in the groups and that worked fine. But we're also, I think, smaller than some of the other things. And since it was from before libraries closed, there weren't as many things that were due because people had been returning things or renewing them already. You know, it's also possible that it worked so well for me because I'm, you know, right, I'm always a night owl, but, you know, when everything's going on in the house at once and everybody's here, I, you know, do a lot of work, like, after everybody goes to bed at 10 o'clock. So maybe it's easier to do when all of you people aren't, you know, in there trying to change your due dates, too, and all of the, you know, I always find that it's a lot easier to, it's a lot easier, I find, to do work on the system in the middle of the night, you know, as so long as I don't hit that 2 a.m. Uh, cron job deadline, you know. Could be that you have that special power over computers that makes them heal instantly. I do sometimes, but not at home. As a medical librarian, your healing power should be unmatched, Fred. Um, let's see. Uh, 
Yeah, Bob said he did get the list initially, so if you can get that, you're probably okay. But it sounds like you guys were timing out before the list came up even, so that's still not so helpful. Uh, is everyone keeping a list of all the changes they're making that they're going to have to undo when you open back up? Because <laughs> um, I talked to someone who hadn't been doing that at, not in our consortium, but just another local librarian, and she was like, oh my gosh, I gotta start writing that down now because I'm going I'm sure I'm already forgetting things that we did, and it's gonna be a nightmare when we open it back up. So we figured you probably all were, but it's a good reminder to people. <laughs> no, to <be> <laughs> what, what's the fun in that? <laughs> I mean, it's gonna be a disaster anyways. Why not pile on a little more? Yeah. There's have, so many messes we're gonna have to clean up anyway. Yeah, just add to that challenge level. Yeah, I like <laughs> a challenge. Uh, one of my challenges is trying to figure out what's going on with the um, Rittenhouse R2 digital library books. And I have a uh, digital ocean image that I can play around with, but I'm gonna have to keep notes. Like, okay, what did I do? And I'm kind of hampered because I'm still waiting for our IT department to say, yeah, go ahead and move it from the in-house server. And I don't think they're, they have other things in their mind right now. This is going to be an interesting challenge. Yep. Oh, yeah, Michael pointed out that, um, well, at the very least, if you're putting in tickets and Bywater's making changes for you, they're going to know, slash, you'll be able to look at your tickets and know what you had them do. Um, but yeah, if you, if you're making a change on your own, you should definitely be keeping track of that. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah, I, I don't think Bywater's going to be able to know all the changes that you make on your own, so. Yeah. Not mine, anyway. <laughs> yeah, especially not yours, Fred. Okay. Any other? <laughs> Heather says Bywater seems pretty psychic to us. And Ed's using a wiki page to track all his changes. We have like a shared Google Doc for all our systems people so we can go in and say, here are the system wide changes that we're making. So we can undo them all later. <laughs> And we have a library that's withdrawing in the middle of this, so that's interesting because we're trying to figure out what all we need to do. Ooh, who's withdrawing? Yours. Aw. <laughs> um, so that's, they're like withdrawing at the end of June. So this month was when we were starting to like look at, you know, what items there patrons have checked out that belong to the rest of the consortium and stuff like that. So that's just more and different settings to keep track of to if we open back up before they leave, make sure that like their patrons aren't getting holds filled from our branches too close to when they're leaving. <laughs> so yeah. Um, I just wanted to say we're working on a blog post for um, when libraries reopen, what you need to look at and what you need to do, and it'll be like a three-part series. And then there's a town hall on Tuesday, April 21st, about reopening your library, where we'll kind of talk about what you need to look through and stuff like that. So keep an eye out for that. That'll be out within the next week or so, I think. Great. Um... That week is a very busy week because we've also got the consortia SIG and the acquisitions SIG and the fundraising committee and Kohathon and the development committee all meeting that week too. So it'll be a busy week. Okay. Thanks everyone. I think that that's it for this meeting. We'll have the conference meeting in five minutes. 
Thanks everyone for coming.